my name is Chrissy, and this is my eighth vlog, I think. So it's seven or eight. I don't really remember. So this week's reading is called the class, the definition of play and the classification of games. So basically, this article broke down how people see play and how they see games. And it was mainly based on Jay Huizinga, um, his idea of play. And he, he defined it as, uh, summing up the formal characteristics of play, we might call it a free activity standing quite consciously outside ordinary life as being not serious, but at the same time absorbing the player intensely and utterly. Um, it proceeds within its own proper boundaries of time and space according to fixed rules and in an orderly manner, and it promotes the formation of social groupings which tend to surround themselves with secrecy and distress other differences between the common world by disguise or other means. Um, you know, as I was reading, there were different aspects that he discussed, and there were um, two definitions that came into play. The first one was um, that, let me find it, um, play tends to remove the very nature of the mysterious. Um, or on the other hand, when the secret, the mask, or the costume fulfills a sacramental function, one can be sure that not play, but an institution is involved and that mysterious or make-believe by nature approaches play moreover. Um, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. All that is mysterious or make-believe by nature approaches play. Moreover, it must be that the function or fiction of diversion is to remove the mystery. The second is um, you view play as an action denuded of all material interest simply excludes bets and games of chance and different kinds of play can be gambling, casinos, racetracks, lotteries, um, you know, all these different things. Um, he said that game is designed to be extremely lucrative, lucrative or luminous. Um, it's defined as free and voluntary activities. You know, there's a lot of different aspects of play. And um, one of the basic characteristics is the fact that each player denotes himself spontaneously to the game of his free will and for his pleasure each time, completely free to choose retreat, silence, meditation, idle solitude, creativity, da -da -da -da. all these different things. So as I'm reading this idea of play, play, um, you know, I'm thinking of the sign language student where you know you start out you have this idea of sign language and it really just attracts you and it's very interesting to you so you know you begin to take classes begin to learn more about the culture and then you find that um, you know you really take to it it's pleasurable for you um, you know, you, you just love it. And then as you, you know, dive deeper into the, the language, you start to, to learn all of um, the game's domain. So, or the, the language's domain. In that, um, things become more restricted. There's certain rules that you have to, you know, apply and stick to. So you can't just, you know, create this sign and, you know, that that's a universal sign for everyone. Everyone's going to know it. You have rules. And um, I know, I think I mentioned this before, this idea of signed English and ASL, American Sign Language. So the rules within ASL are different than signed English in that uh, give you an example. If you say 
divorce. This is signed English because you start with the first letter of the word divorce. Divorce. So in ASL, this is marry, so this is going to be divorce. So you're separating. So one of the big rules is in ASL, anything initialized, any kind of sign like that is a no-no. So you can, you know, have fun with it and everything, but you have to realize that there are limitations and there are things that you can't do in, in ASL that you can do in other, other languages associated with sign. Um, so we dive, we then dive into the game idea. Um, within here, it's said that the game consists of the need to find or continue at once a response which is free within the set limits by the rules. Um, you know, there are all these different types of games. Um, let's see if I can find... So there's, you know, all these classifications. And then there's an analysis. Um, permits play to be defined as an activity, which is essentially, and it lists six different... Six? I can't find the camera. Um, breakdowns, I guess. So there's free, which playing is not obligatory. Um, once it loses its attractive and joyous quality, you know, you're, you're kind of done with it. Um, separate. So there's, it's circumscribed within a limit of space and time, defined and fixed in advance. Uncertain, um, the course is not determined, the result attained, the result is not attained beforehand. Um, it's based on the player's initiative. Unproductive, um, creating neither goods nor wealth, nor new elements of any kind, ending in a situation identical to the prevailing at the beginning of the game. So, you really don't get anything out of the game. Um, governed by rules, suspend ordinary laws, uh, establish new legislation, and then make-believe, which is special awareness of a second reality or a free unreality. So then, after this breakdown, we really dive into the classification of games. And within here, we hit the fundamental categories. And within here, I wanted to focus on a, a specific game that I know in deaf events we always run into, especially when it was the, you know, the basic levels of sign language. So when if you went to a deaf event, you would always, you know, play this game called the ABC game. So the way it's played is um, you, you sit around in a circle and one person starts the game and their first letter is going to be A. So they have to come up with a sign that starts with the letter A. Then once they're done, you know, you go down the line and everyone has to come up with a different letter, but it's also a memory game because you are remembering the signs preceding you and after you. So essentially if I did A, you did B, you'd have I would do A, then you would do A B. Next person would do A B C and they'd have to remember all the signs leading up to them. So there is, I'll talk to you about the fundamental categories, which are a gon, um, a group, a whole group of games which seem to be competitive. Adversaries should confront each other under ideal conditions susceptible of giving precise and contestable value to the winner's triumph. Two individuals or teams are in opposition. So in ABC, there's not necessarily, you know, opposition, but... There's really no way to win or lose. You know, you some people play, if you don't remember it, you're knocked out. And then that, you know, the winner is the one who can say, you know, all, all the way down the line. So in that sense, that is a gone. So it's this competitive, like, 
um, a rivalry. Like you want to, you want to have the best memory to beat everyone else, and you know there's always some kind of fun little gift or prize, whatever. Um, then there is Athea, which is the game of dice. Um, all games are based on decision independent of the player, an outcome over which has no control, and in which winning is the result of fate rather than triumphing over an adversary. So the, this concept of um, Aaliyah, 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 um, is in this particular game is your seating arrangement. So you have no... You know, uh, you know, it's not up to you which letter you receive. It just depends on your seating arrangement. So, you, I, this is kind of a combination of Agon and Aaliyah. So, your seating, which would be more Aaliyah, um, you have no control over. You're seated where you are, and whatever letter comes to you, how many people get knocked out in the process, <clears throat> you need to play from there. Where a gone is your ability to, you know, think and, you know, beat everyone else. So then we have mimicry. And this, some people find it funny in the ABC game to kind of mimic the person before them. So the idea of mimicry is um, play can consist not only of deploying actions or submitting to one's fate in an imagery milieu, but of becoming an illusory character oneself. Makes believe or makes other others believe that he's someone other than himself. So mimicry is like a child that wants to be like their parent. Like the uh, little girl is going to try to you know, wash dishes, clean the house, it kind of, um, uh, traditional, for a good word, traditional stuff, play house, whereas the man wants to go, you know, do work, you know, follow his dad, I want to go drive the car, I want to do, you know, all these different things, and, um, I guess the relation to the game is going to be, you know, some people like to mimic the person before them, like how they do their signing, and it just, it, it creates a funny, you know, kind of situation and atmosphere. It's, it's fun. Um, but in another relation to the idea of mimicry is, you know, the children that as they grow up, they, you know, watch their parents sign and that's how they learn and, you know, memorize and retain all of the signs. And it's the same for hearing culture. So, you know, you grow up, you hear a word, ask your parents what it means. And then, you know, you have this sensory, like you're always, you're seeing, you're hearing, all these different things. So then the last one is the idea of... Um, vertigo. So, um, it consists of an attempt to momentarily destroy the stability of perception and inflict a kind of volu voluptuous panic upon an otherwise lucid mind, surrendering to a kind of spasm, seizure, seizure or shock, which destroys reality with sovereign brusque, whatever that word is, brusqueness. Um, this one was kind of hard. I, uh, <laughs> I think my best relation to deaf culture with this is, um, you know, maybe the idea that deaf individuals can become a part of the hearing world and in that I don't I don't think it's necessarily like ludicrous and crazy but there was one um, you know a drive which is normally repressed so 
for deaf culture, people feel a very strong connection with the culture. They feel that deaf should stay deaf and that they should learn sign language and keep the culture very strong and support each other. Um, so the idea that cochlear implants or hearing aids, you know, they're, they're kind of like pushed to the side, like not necessary. And I think that would be the best idea of, of vertigo. Um, it's not a direct relation, but I would say it's, it's the closest that I can really get to with deaf culture. Just, you know, you always want to stay within your culture. Like hearing people should learn English, you know, whatever language your country is. Stay. And deaf people should remain deaf. I will see you next week.